following is a video presentation via Zoom of the Civil War Roundtable of the District of Columbia. Founded in 1951, the Roundtable hosts monthly presentations at a location near Washington, D.C., more recently at the Fort Myer Officers Club. For more information, go to www.cwrtdc.org. Well, first of all, I want, I want to say uh, that uh, what prompted all of this is, of course, uh, my uh, my tour at Gettysburg, or Gettysburg at Vicksburg with Ed and uh, Terry Winchell uh, a couple of years ago, and getting to go to Champion Hill and the Cairo and all those places with Ed. You know, it was it was the whole Vicksburg campaign actually? And then when I saw Don's book, I read I read it. And I've read Vicksburg books before, but I found this to be most uh, enthralling, especially because, you know, as you guys all know, I'm an infectious disease specialist, and he throws a lot of the influence of disease, which there's plenty in the Vicksburg campaign, and he'll talk about that in the course, I'm sure, but that was really what attracted me to it, and I said, um, yeah, we want to get him as a speaker. Uh, having said all that, of course, preliminarily, I'll just say I don't have to tell most of the people here about what Vicksburg was. And it was the last stronghold of the Confederacy in the Mississippi River. Uh, and uh, it was, Lincoln called it the key. Uh, most people think that that, uh, that even though the, both these battles ended on uh, July 3rd of 1863, that Vicksburg was probably more important than, Gettysburg, even though I'm a Gettysburg guy and spent a lot of time there, probably in the course of the war, Vicksburg was more important. And Don really tells the story of the whole campaign in, in his book. Uh, and Grant himself uh, called Vicksburg the most important battle of the war. It really sealed the fate of the Confederacy. And it certainly uh, solidified Grant's reputation uh, as the most capable Union general uh, certainly uh, bringing him more to Lincoln's attention, which ultimately, of course, uh, uh, allowed Lincoln to appoint him as overall commander. Our speaker tonight, Do uh, Donald Miller, is the J uh, John Henry McCracken Professor of History Emeritus at Lafayette College. He is the author of 10 books, which included not only Vicksburg's Grant Camber campaign, the campaign that broke the Confederacy, but also Masters of the Air, America's bomber, bomber boys who fought, who fought uh, the air war against uh, Germany, which is also being made into a television series by Tom Hanks, S Steven Spielberg, and others. Okay, having said all of that, um, so the first question I want to ask you is, is why and how you wrote the book and how it's different from other histories of the Gettysburg, or Vicksburg campaign. Well, I, I should explain first, John, that um, I was not trained as a military historian. I, I have a degree in philosophy and uh, later went on at Maryland and Yale and uh, took a course of studies called intell pretentiously intellectual history, history of ideas. And I didn't write my first military history book until the mid 90s. And it wasn't on Vicksburg. It was on World War Two. And I did two other books on World War II after that. But I began the Vicksburg book in the 90s. I wanted to know more about the Civil War, a simple curiosity. I started reading, you know, um, I started watching Ken Burns' series. It was, it was transfixing. I thought, what the hell? I'll, I'll, I'll learn it by teaching it. I taught, a, I taught an intercession course, a short course on Vicksburg. I was one day ahead of the students. <laughs> and I was really pulled into the thing. And I... I talked to Ken about his film and I, I work with him once in a while, as Christine knows, and I said, How, why did you do so little on Vicksburg? And he said, well, there weren't a lot of images to deal with. Well, I went down to the Library of Congress and found that there were a lot of images on Vicksburg. <laughs> and um, I was pulled further into it because as I kept reading, also there was a Chicago connection. I had just done a book on Chicago and um, 36 Illinois boys fought at Vicksburg and are memorialized down there, as you guys know, who have been to Vicksburg in that William LeBaron Jenny pantheon-like monument. And Jenny's a character in my Chicago book. He's a park planner, and he built the first steel frame skyscraper in the world. 
uh, a beautiful soaring structure that no longer exists in Chicago. And Jenny was uh, Sherman's engineer and later one of the chief engineers on the siege line. And he didn't write an autobiography, but he wrote a, a series of transfixing accounts of the exhibitions, ex expeditions into the, in particularly into the Yazoo River Delta area that were absolutely fascinating. So I thought I gotta go to this place. So I went down there and um, as you know, I think I told you in a conversation we had earlier from the Washington residents, um, I ran Ed Bars. I'd never met, I met Ed, I'd met Ed recently, recently but I, I didn't know him well. I interviewed him for a book I did on the Pacific War. Uh, his, um, his Marine Ranger Battalion you know, experiences in New Britain and Guadalcanal. And he's a wonderful guy. And he said, you gotta get to Vicksburg sometime. And serendipitously, when I went down to Vicksburg on my own, I ran into Ed. And uh, he was about to give a tour and he said, wait here. And uh, I, I looked around, I met Terry Winchell. I went in and introduced myself. Um, that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship. And, um, and Ed came back and said, get your boots on buddy, we're going on a tour. And uh, out we went onto the battlefield and holy hell, I thought the bullets were flying by my ears but listening to Ed. I mean, he was absolutely transfixing. And this is my first experience with the guy. He was, he was good in the interview, but he was sensational on the battlefield. And he had a buddy with him named Warren Graybow, who I'm sure a lot of you know, and Warren wrote a hell of a book on Vicksburg, uh, a geographical history of it. And he worked on the Cairo project with, uh, with bars. And we were rolling along and he kept screaming out, look at the terrain, look at the terrain. Civil War battlefields aren't fought on pool tables. And um, finished the day, went out for dinner, had a few pops, and as you mentioned, at the end of the conversation, as he's getting up, I intended to stay and close the bar, but he got, he's getting up and he says to me, Miller, you know why you're gonna write the best book on Vicksburg? I said, no, Ed. He says, cause you don't know a goddamn thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He said, we're all writing it, this history. And I got three volumes on it. And he said, I think we're starting to write the same thing. And uh, one book <laughs> the other. And he said, we need some new perspectives. We need some fresh perspectives. And maybe you could come into this thing. You've tackled a couple of other books as first time projects. Didn't know a damn thing about Chicago either. I heard when you started that book. I said, well, geez, I'm getting all this flattery, which would take flattery. But anyway, we, we kept in touch after that. So I went back down again. And, and I always begin, uh, as Christine knows, from our series, Biography of America, like her, I'm interested in terrain. I'm interested in terrain and I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in, in, in the combat experience. Yes. I'm interested in fear. I'm interested in courage. What is it? Um, when does it break down? When men experience fear, how do they overcome it? So that whole combat thing was going to get in here, but I wanted to take it to another level because I consider myself, and I'll stop talking in a second here, but I don't consider myself a military historian. I consider myself an historian of warfare. Warfare has tremendous ramifying effects on men, women, and children. Um, people who are the detritus of war, uh, the civilian population, 40 million in World War II out of 60 million killed, civilians and the aged. Um, I'm interested, as you pointed out, in medicine. I'm interested in people who are caught in siege operations and people who are under the bombs, not just dropping bombs. So I wanted to capture the full experience of Vicksburg, to do the Rebels and the Yankees. And it's a woman's story too, because there's a, over two dozen um, mesmerizing diaries of women caught in a 47 day siege and just plummeled um, by Admiral Porter from the river and Grant's army from the interior. So, and I came across a quote by Twain. He said, you gotta read, you gotta see Vicksburg because it has, he writes it in his book on the Mississippi because it has everything naval warfare, cave warfare, you name it. And, and I also thought that different from other books, some occasional books do the whole shoot match, the whole Pittsburgh campaign. You gotta remember it was 16 months. It started with the Navy, it didn't start with Grant. With the Navy starting in the Gulf, coming up and surprising the Confederates by coming up from Ship Island through the Straits into New Orleans and capturing New Orleans without firing a shot. They had a hell of a battle at the forts below New Orleans, but they captured the city without firing a shot. And that's in April of 1862. And that's when this thing begins and it lasts 16 months. They go upriver to be brief. They capture Natchez, they capture Baton Rouge, 
but they can't take Vicksburg. They can't elevate their guns high enough. They don't have enough troops. Uh, General Halleck is in Tennessee at the time, and he doesn't release Sherman and Grant, who wanted desperately to get down to Vicksburg, which is one regiment from two regiments, I would say, from uh, Grant's army, um, Haley Halleck's army. They could have taken Vicksburg right there, and that had been it. But it doesn't happen. They bring down the ironclads. They unite with these gigantic three-masted ships that Farragut brought in from New Orleans. So, and they start to bombard the city and they don't have a landing force. And it's the middle of the disease season and guys are dying like flies to catch the cliche. And um, they can't survive anymore. Um, they're losing more men. They're not gonna have enough men in a week and a half to take the boats back up to Memphis or back down to New Orleans. So I thought that's a big story. And um, I wanted to try to capture it in its fullness. And, um, and also, when you're researching a book, you always find more than you expect if you're researching it thoroughly. And I did 51 archives for this one. And I found, and we'll talk about this in a minute, more news about 11, but the inside, inside the battle is a social revolution, the first one in American history. And that's the revolt of the Mississippi slaves and Grant's releasing in the course of the Vicksburg campaign, freeing 100,000 probably 106,000 slaves and putting 26,000 of them roughly in Union Blue. And that's the beginning of the liberation of Mississippi and the end of the slaveocracy in Mississippi. And, uh, and Grant will carry that way of fighting warfare, capturing slaves as, as well as killing soldiers. It'll carry that to Petersburg and, uh, and finish off the South. So long answer, but that's how I got into it. And I kept going back. I kept going back. I, I, I got a motorboat. I rented it. I had a Jeep. You gotta remember this thing is 640 miles long. It's from Cairo, where all the gunboats came from. The troops came from there. The hospitals uh, were located there. If you got shot at Vicksburg, you went to Cairo. If you got bacon at Vicksburg, it came from Chicago through Cairo. Cairo is a little southern city in Illinois. It's, it's, it's more southern than Richmond. It points right at Vicksburg. And that's where Grant started. He arrives there in, I think it's September, I forget the exact date, September 1861, his first command. And from there, this is an effort by Grant to capture not just Vicksburg, but the entire Mississippi Valley. Everything all the way down to, uh, to New Orleans. And with help, tremendous help from the Navy, and I bring the Navy in here a lot. Uh, it's an amphibious campaign. It's like D-Day. And uh, by July 4th, 3rd, 4th, it's, it, it's a surrender took place on the 4th. Um, the fait accompli was the 3rd. And, uh, it, and it has these tremendous ramifying effects, and I'd be happy to talk about Gettysburg comparisons and things like that. So, um, sorry for the long answer, John. I thought I'd just lay it out there. No, that was, that was great, actually. Um, you touched on this, I think, but um, how your book was different from other, other uh, hi histories of Vicksburg, which get more into the, you know, what regiment was here and all of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and also, um, can you talk a little bit about Grant himself and his, uh, you know, we talk about uh, Sherman when he marched to the sea and, and uh, all the slaves that they emancipated, but talk about Grant and what happened with the slaves uh, during the Vicksburg campaign when his- Well, a lot, it, one of my gripes about a lot of American history, the way it's taught <laughs> is, students, I, I teach high school uh, teachers in the summer for the World War II Museum in New Orleans. <laughs> So I see a lot of high school teachers and the way they're told to teach it is causes, one or two events in the war, maybe D-Day, Pearl Harbor, and then the consequences. And I think to me, the most interesting thing is how wars are fought. That's where the effects really come in um, because the next war is always about how the last, how it was fought, not just who won. So, um, you know, I, you know, I got, pulled into, in, 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 into the study of history like that, trying to understand history like a novelist uh, with contingency and um, surprise and a little humor and all the ingredients I think that go to make a good story 
can be wrapped into this thing. And you've got the greatest character ever in U.S. Grant. And he has, <laughs> he has a dilemma when he goes into Vicksburg. He doesn't want to be a liberator. Um, he's not an abolitionist. Uh, he doesn't believe in slavery, but he's not an abolitionist. But when he's ready to undertake his first and failed invasion of Vicksburg in, in October of 1862, Halleck had gone back, his commander had gone back east to become chief of staff. Grant and Sherman are pretty much on their own and cook up with Porter in Tennessee and Grant's going into Northern Tennessee. And um, he, before he leaves, even before he sets out, his camps are inundated by escaped slaves because the area he's in, he's got about 40,000 troops there. These two railroad towns on the Mississippi, Tennessee border. They've got over 40,000 slaves in their camps, almost more slaves than soldiers. And Grant can't move effectively with that kind of army of, of, of liberated slaves. So he calls in a chaplain, a guy by the name of John Eaton, and he sets up what's known later as a contraband camp. They take over a the Confederates got out of the area quickly when Grant showed up. All the plantations were abandoned, all of them. Slaves took over, they had the slaves take over the plantation, put crops in the ground, paid the slaves, and protected them with Yankee soldiers they had just brought into the Union Army. And Grant would continue to do this building, you know, those 40 contraband camps down in the Mississippi Valley. So Eaton handles this operation, Grant oversees it, and he it effectively releases his army from military operations. And the other point about Grant is he becomes a military emancipator. If you just focus on Lincoln, as everybody knows, is, you know, maybe I'm going into cliche here, but if you just focus on the Emancipation Proclamation, you miss the whole point. Frederick Douglass himself said the declaration that Grant declared, excuse me, that Lincoln declared, Grant made effective with a sword. Almost all emancipation during the Civil War was military emancipation. It was done by the army. Okay. The abolitionists could shoot, could, could hoot and holler in the North, but Lincoln's not even going to free slaves in the border slave states because he doesn't feel he can. So I'm sure the South laughed at the proclamation when it was passed. Uh, I can imagine a Mississippi planter sitting on his front porch with his so-called darkies in the field and laughing at the proclamation. How could he enforce it here? It only the proclamation freed slaves in states in active rebellion against the Union, uh, secession, if you will. But then it meant something when Grant showed up on your front lawn, <laughs> and that was the difference. And once he goes into Mississippi, more and more slaves, in addition to the ones Eaton is um, taking care of back in Tennessee, continue to flock to his armies. And then I found something really interesting. I started going through these soldier letters. And there's always one pivotal letter that, that kind of gets you. And this was from an Indiana father. Now he's from that corn and hog belt in Southern Indiana that's leaning secession. And um, he tells his son after the Emancipation Proclamation, see when Grant went into Vicksburg, it's right at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's gonna be you know, go into effect on Jan 1, 63. Um, and the letter says, he says to his son, I think his son's name was Ho Howard. Boy, you come home, he says. He's a, he's a corn and hog farmer himself. You come home. You didn't fight this damn war for the N-I-G-G-E-R. You didn't fight for that. That's what this, you, you went south to fight for union and you come home. And the son writes back, I ain't coming home because we're doing good down here freeing slaves. And um, the kid got it, that every slave they took from the rebels was one last man in their army because they built fortifications. They were spies for the Confederacy. Uh, what gunboats the Confederates built, they, they used with, you know, you used black labor for. And also they're growing cotton in areas that aren't, Grant hasn't liberated and, um, and the cotton sold for guns. So the troops began to see this. They also developed, like we did in Vietnam, this intense dislike, strangely war does this to people, this intense dislike of the local population. Um, we threw around words like gook and things like this in the war from the enemy, but here there's a cultural imperialism these kids carry with them in kind of the best sense of the word too though. They come from farms in Iowa and Illinois that are neatly maintained. Tools are hung up, the cattle are fenced, 
Well, that didn't happen in the South. The hogs ran free. The tools were lying rusted on the ground. An overseer with his shirt off, with tobacco spilling down his face, is yelling, F you, F you to the slaves. They saw whippings and things like that. Just this whole messy, the, the, the women weren't as attractive as they thought. Most of them swore to high heaven and they, they smoked, they chewed tobacco and they used snuff. And that was repellent to a lot of troops. Now you think, what does that have to do with it? Well, all of a sudden, this generates this intense dislike at the end. And also they're feeding other Confederate guerrillas and uh, that Grant's trying to protect. Grant tried to protect people who proclaim loyalty to the North. And maybe we can build and re-knit Tennessee back together as a union state if we can um, treat these people amicably. But these soldiers saw that these people who were being favored by Grant were actually harboring guerrillas who were killing Union troops and, uh, and feeding rebel soldiers and guerrillas. So when they go on the march into Mississippi with Grant in 62, all their letters reflect this. They burn, they plunder. I don't know how much rape there was. It's 16 recorded cases of it. Um, but it was, it was tough on, on the civilian population there. And Sherman and Grant tried to stop it. This is Sherman, you know, <laughs> of, of Georgia fame. And actually he, he learned to fight like this from Grant, but um, he, he even issues a proclamation that soldiers entering Southern homes will be hanged. And uh, what they're trying to do, Grant and Sherman, is maintain military discipline. And, um, and they can't do it if anarchy is sweeping through and social revolution is breaking out and anarchy is sweeping through the armies. But they can't control it. And later, he and Lincoln, Grant Lincoln, figure that this is working. And the second time Grant goes into Vicksburg when he, he's defeated in 62, uh, as, as most of you know, and when Sherman got beaten at Chickasaw Bayou and Grant got a supply line nipped and he had to turn around. But when he goes down a second time in January of 63, uh, he's gonna continue to fight like this. He's gonna continue to fight like this. And even when they had them boxed up inside Vicksburg after this long struggle to capture Vicksburg, the 47 day siege, the longer, it seems to me that the longer Vicksburg held on, the worse it got for them because there's no Confederate army in the vicinity to protect the civilians. Now. There is an army under Joseph Johnson, an army, of, a rescue army that's being formed in Jackson, Mississippi, about 45 miles away to the east. But Joseph Johnston never fights. He, he never challenges Grant. By the time he's in a position to do it, Grant outnumbers him two to one. And, um, but the, um, that's, 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 that's a whole different story, the, the, the siege operation. But, Grant, while the siege is going on, is sending raiding parties all over the South, and they're bringing back cattle, beef, slaves, and what they're not bringing back, they're burning. So they destroy the whole economic infrastructure, the whole cotton kingdom in, in the state. And, uh, and it's a new thing, this thing, this cotton kingdom. I think that's why the South fought so tenaciously because we always think of the South, oh, you know, the Margaret Mitchell novel, you know, and the beautiful, you know, uh, dry, beautiful walkways and, uh, and gardens and, you know, uh, life on the veranda and all that. But I came across a novel that, as you know, John, I talk about early on in the book, Faulkner's, I opened the book with Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. And there's a little fable in there, I think, that, affected, that, that, that ties into Vicksburg. In the story, this brilliant, I think the best of the Faulkner novels, it takes place in the 1830s when Mississippi is just taking off as a cotton area. And it takes place in Jefferson County, which is really Oxford, Mississippi, Faulkner's hometown. And this stranger comes into town, he's named Thomas Sutton, and he comes in with a, about 13 or 14 slaves that he had been an overseer in Haiti, and he bought them. And he buys land outside town, and he and the slaves strip down naked, coat themselves with clay to keep off the mosquitoes. And they go into the swamps for months and months and months 
and they pull out timber and everything else and clay and they build a house, a plantation house. When it's finished, it doesn't have doorknobs, chandeliers, nothing. It's just a big shack. And then he sends the slaves on wagons to the Mississippi. They buy chandeliers, doorknobs, rugs, hangings, and all this stuff. He goes into town and he marries a woman when it's all finished. She comes out and she's a plantation grandee and so is he. And it wasn't 10 years later then the Civil War breaks out. That's how new the South was. And I thought, Vicksburg has an area just like that. The Yazoo Delta, just above Vicksburg. The Yazoo River is just to the north of Vicksburg, behind the Walnut Hills. And it extends all the way to Memphis. And it's almost impenetrable at the time by armies. And um, planters from, many from the east, from the northeast. Vicksburg was, had a lot of northerners and, and it voted against secession. Um, it's a cosmopolitan town too, with bookstores and churches and good libraries. But anyway, these, it's, you know, Jefferson Davis practiced law there. Um, these people who lived in town wanted the land. There's a, they, they wanted to speculate in the magnificently fertile land of the Yazoo Delta, this rich black Mississippi mud, and which grew cotton bountifully. So they brought in legions of slaves in chains across the Appalachians and took them in there. And for a time, the white population outnumbered the black population 500 to one. Instead of going in themselves, the planters sent in, black. They sent in overseers. And they built that area up and it started to flourish in the 1850s. And then they go to war. And in the novel, Thomas Sutton and his, uh, his son joined the Confederate army in Faulkner doesn't go into detail on this, but, but he does go into detail when they come back. Everything's gone. Slaves, farms, crops, forests, entire forests, everything's gone. It's a wasteland. And this is what the sin of slavery in Faulkner's mind does to the Southern mind. And, um, the, um, and it has haunting effects. Um, and Faulkner's good because he, he also has sympathy, empathy for the, the planter class because uh, he's got strains of racism in his own mind. And, and yet he feels that this was a ruination of the South. But I kept thinking, Vicksburgians fought so hard. I read the letters of the troops. I mean, God, they had it much worse than the Yankees. They had to be on the line all the time, generally without shelter. Um, tornadoes come up to Mississippi in the spring and summer whipping rainstorms, uh, burning heat, um, tremendous outbreaks of uh, diarrhea and, and, and more serious diseases. And they had to s sleep on their guns all the time. Grant had enough troops that he could rotate guys four hours on the line at a time and he'd go to, to a pretty nice valley behind the front lines where there were wells that were dug and there was fruit available. And they had a supply line to the north. They got everything, bandages, nurses, you name it pineapples, apples, applesauce, everything from home. So it's, um, it was interesting to, to understand why they fought like that. And I kept thinking, they're getting letters from those families who are rooted in Mississippi, that these Yanks are vandals and Visigoths. And they're, they think they're fighting for their homes. They're not fighting for slavery. I think the Civil War is about slavery, but most of those kids are fighting you know, for their homes. Yeah, so I wanted to try to understand that too, uh, how a nation could fight for slavery and a lot of the kids are fighting just to preserve what they have. Yeah. Okay, okay, well, well, we have a lot of our, our army people in the audience. However, um, I did want to ask you about the Navy's role here, uh, especially the Brownwater Navy under Admiral Porter and, and their role, their central role actually in the Vicksburg campaign. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, originally the Navy was supposed to cooperate after Farragut is um, sent back out to um, blockade duty on the Gulf. He does come back into the story, but mm -hmm. his brother, his foster brother, uh, Dixon Porter, has in the meantime has taken over the gunboat fleet at Cairo, the ironclads. So they help Grant take you know, Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry, and, and on the Mississippi, other generals like Pope take Island Number 10. 
Uh, and they take Memphis and Vicksburg's next. And Porter is supposed to be helping by Lincoln's instructions. John McClernand, another Union commander. <laughs> and he went to Lincoln. He's, he's one of Grant's core commanders. But he's jealous of Grant and he despises him. And they've never gotten along. And he's been undercutting him since he was with Grant from the very beginning at Cairo. He's been undercutting him all the time. You got to have a guy like this in a story. <laughs> and but he's for real. And he goes to the president and Lincoln himself is from Illinois and he doesn't think he's doing very well. And he wasn't in Illinois because, you know, nothing's happening at Vicksburg. And those farmers wanted the Vicksburg taken because they're, they're sending wheat and corn and hogs down the river to trade with Southerners along the river who were intensively involved with cotton cultivation or send them out through New Orleans to England. And it's a, it's a rebel river now. And, and they want to take it. And there's tremendous pressure on Lincoln from the Midwest, even to the point of forming a Northwestern conspiracy. Not a conspiracy really was that, but it was called the Northwestern Confederation to separate from the Union and combine with the Confederacy, not to fight on the side of the rebels, but to uh, go neutral in the war if, they, if Davis, Jeff Davis opened, opened the river. So Grant feels that pressure and um, McLaren's feeling the pressure and he takes the idea to Lincoln to give him an army to go down and take Vicksburg. Now at the same time, Grant knows this what do you say? Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of it. Lincoln knows that Grant's down in Mississippi at the very same time. And he's sending two commanders and two separate armies into the same area without telling either of them. What a mess that would have been. But General Halleck, his, his, his commander, warned Grant about this. And um, Grant sent Sherman to Memphis and said, look, when you get to Memphis, there's a guy named McLaren, he's sending troops down there to form an army to go to Vicksburg, take them. And Sherman took them all, put them on steamers and took them to Vicksburg, <laughs> 40,000 troops. And he took them with Porter. He had formed an alliance with Admiral Porter and Porter's gunboats escort Sherman's fleet down to Vicksburg. And uh, they get there in Christmas season of 62 in that first invasion I described and they get slaughtered. But that's the beginning of the cooperation. And after that, Porter sticks with Grant. He hates McClernand. And wherever, you know, in the, in the tough country of Mississippi, I remember one scene in, in, I use in the book that's taken from James Wilson, um, one of his aides, uh, Grant's aide, where they're standing there, Sherman and Grant and Wilson and Jenny and they're looking out at the river and looking across at the mile wide river. And there's this Citadel city with these terraced, you know, um, hills. And there's no landing place on the other side. You can't do a coup de main. There's a 450 mile long swamp on the other side. Grant had sent scouts in there, Wilson actually. And he said, impenetrable by foot or any sizable boat. Can't go there. Can you go south and capture Vicksburg going that way? No, it's flooded. Uh, Louisiana is flooded from Grant's camps and just across the river in Louisiana all the way down 150 miles. So um, the only way you can move around is with the Navy and it becomes almost entirely amphibious operations from there until the siege. And Grant said later, I, I couldn't have taken the place. He said as his autobiography, his memoirs, I wouldn't have even tried to take Vicksburg without Porter and the Navy. And the cool thing is, they didn't have to listen to one another. You know, there's intense dislike in the Army for the Navy, the Navy for the Army, and they're rivals. And they didn't, have, Porter didn't have to obey Grant, and Grant wasn't his commander, and, um, by, you know, vice versa. But they cooperated wonderfully. And, and, and that threesome, when, when that military trinity, when you throw Sherman in there, you know, works some wonders in a campaign. Because it was really a near bust. I think if Grant had been in the East, where he had a lot of newspaper coverage, I'm back, yeah. coverage, you know, that helped to really, you know, 
undermine um, Hooker and other guys, uh, Grant would have been removed. Uh, Lincoln had pretty much, in fact, I found a letter in the archives, not a great find, but I don't see anybody else doing it. I think might maybe Juan Catton, where Stanton had actually written out an order removing Grant and just was asking for Lincoln's approval. And then Lincoln stuck with him because nothing's happening. And then in one instance, Grant is told emphatically, do not go into the Delta and don't especially go into the Delta with these extraordinarily valuable and powerful gunboats. The streams are too shallow and they're too narrow. Grant in desperation wanted to get above Vicksburg, maybe attack it from the north and get behind it. So he sent an expedition, he sent a number of expeditions, but he sends one expedition with Sherman and a number of brigades and he sends Porter in there and Porter and Sherman actually went and Porter and the gunboats led the way. Sherman came behind with the troop transports and they got trapped. Um, they surrounded Porter's boats. They got him first. He was in the lead. And they were about to board the gunboats, the five best gunboats he had. And don't forget, he loses the gunboats. The battle's over. Porter's gone. The gunboats are gone. He issues orders to get out, down into the swamp where he's stuck. And they, had, they, they, they came into a, a shallow area where they had him from behind and in front. Confederate guerrillas. And he said, get the mud and smear the, the boats with mud so they can't, it's more difficult to board. Open the gun chests, it's hand to hand fighting. If we lose, we try to make it for the forest and walk back to Vicksburg and they got the gunboats. He sent a note to Sherman, gave it to a slave, wrapped it in a leaf of tobacco and asked Sherman um, to come quickly to his aid. The slave found Sherman and Sherman made an all night march through the swamps. Uh, the drummer boys had their drums on top of their heads because the water was up to their, up to their uh, chins. The soldiers put candles in, in their barrels of their muskets and found their way through the swamp. And they got there in just the nick of the time, just as the Confederate guerrillas and cavalry were about to board and small infantry outfits were about to board Porter's boats. Lincoln found out about that and went, uh, Grant tried to hide it. He tried to hide a lot of things. I mean, he wasn't necessarily lying, but he, right through the Virginia campaign later, he always underestimated his casualties and downplayed his losses, knowing he was on the verge of getting removed. And there's talk at the time of his drinking as well. But Lincoln, you know, almost, I think, removed him at that point. Yeah. But that would have been something, that turning point. <laughs> And you know, well, John, you don't, you, don't, you don't think about that stuff because of the way history's taught. I mean, I remember when I, my kids took history 100 years ago, see, in high school. My son came home and said to me one time, well, hell, why even study? We know what happened. I said, that's a good point. <laughs> he said, I know who won Gettysburg. Where the hell are we going there? <laughs> I said, well, it's the how, you know. That's important that it, it happens. And, and, and as you saw, the how led to the freedom of 130,000 sl 100, slaves. But then if you know the result, then they put up these charts and we've all seen them in the high school textbooks. The South had more railroads, more industry, more pop, excuse me, the North, more population than the South. So why even fight the damn thing? And well, but you do fight it because as all of us know who studied the Civil War, there were turning points in the war when the South, not even by military action, but just by attritional warfare, holding on like the Japanese did in the Pacific, they could wear us down. And if Lincoln had lost in 64, that was an election. The last one we had the other day was a big one. This one was for this. Will there continue to be the United States of America? And and for the South, it's annihilation or we succumb to the North. It's a, it's a big one, but you can win the war in various kinds of ways. So you do want to get in and, and see the fighting and see what happened and see that there were turning points. I don't notice any of these charts about industry, superiority, anything else for the American Revolution. <laughs> oh. <laughs> don't stand a chance. <laughs> 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 I'm, I want to I ask you one question before we, we open it up for questions. Um, of course, 
I am a Gettysburg guy, but I have to ask you um, uh, why you think Vicksburg was more important uh, than Gettysburg in deciding the uh, the outcome of the war. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a Gettysburg guy. I mean, uh, <coughs> I have my students read Killer Angels and Sears and everything else, and we go to the battlefields twice in, in, in an average semester course. We're close. Uh, I teach in Eastern Pennsylvania. We're an hour and a half from Gettysburg. I grew up not too far from Gettysburg. That was the one I was always drawn to. And so I'm not denigrating Vicksburg. It was a, you know, unbelievably. Vicksburg, Gettysburg is really important in this respect. Suppose we had lost. You have to think of it like that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's when you think of it strategically. But what happens is Gettysburg recovers, I should say, Lee recovers rather quickly because Meade lets him get away. Now you have all kinds of disputes in Cottingham and everything, whether Meade was chasing him with alacrity or not, but he did get out. And by all reports that I, where I, I've been working with Gary Gallagher at the University of Virginia on this, we're thinking that Lee had a, probably a stronger army in September, late September, than he had in July at Gettysburg. That's how fast he recovered. And interestingly, Gary Gallagher has done a really good book on morale in the Confederacy around Gettysburg and Vicksburg. And he said, morale didn't plummet at all, literally at all after Gettysburg because of the superhuman qualities that reposed in Lee, according to most Southerners. He was not gonna lose this thing. We're in this. We got the army, we got R.E. Lee. But when these reports came in from Vicksburg, it was demoralizing. I mean, from the time they repelled the Yankees and Farragut and all those gunboats, there this little town of 4,200 was a symbol of Confederate resolve and resistance. Now it's gone. Now the river's gone. And now Grant can get into the South, get into the, you know, using out of the rivers, going west and going up the Red River. But more importantly, Lincoln was very discerning on this. He saw that he always admired Taylor. Lincoln did, and so did Grant, incidentally. And Taylor was a tough fighter uh, who fought hard war, and so did Grant. And Grant brings hard war to the East. He knew after Vicksburg how to defeat the Confederacy. That for the Confederacy was a scary thing. By warring on resources and people, as well as soldiers. So um, I think that's why it, the South, after Vicksburg, doesn't fight another major offensive. Lee gets locked in by Grant. And that's another consequence of Vicksburg. Grant goes east. Yeah. Chattanooga, here he comes. And this is Fraser Ali, man. This is the big one. And for the whole country. And everybody knew and, and, and was written up like this. This is the one that's going to decide but it wouldn't have happened without Vicksburg. If Grant had lost at Vicksburg, he's gone, Sherman's gone, Porter's gone, and the campaign is abandoned, I think. The longer war, the North would have won it, but probably by ceding uh, slavery to the South. And I think, I think Lincoln thought it was pretty important too. He did, he did. I mean, he loved Sheridan. He loved the army. He came to love the army of the Potomac after some rough times. But when they defeated them at Five Forks and chased them down at Appomattox, it was hugely, hugely important. And right after you know, Sherman was completing his march. And, but he knew, as he writes in his memoirs, that the thing that set this whole thing up was Vicksburg. Yeah. So not casting any aspersions on Gettysburg. And it's a much, much more dramatic battle than the siege of Vicksburg. Grant had almost become combat averse. Uh, he said, I don't want to take any casualties during this siege. And he was very careful. Did the same thing at Petersburg, um, so-called Butcher Grant. Um, but uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it's a great battle. And it's ironic that they occur um, and, and it, it, you know, one day apart, the victories, and it was a double whammy. But I think the long-term double whammy was Vicksburg. Jefferson. Okay, let's uh, let's open it up for for questions. 
uh, sir, this is Gary Carlberg. Uh, uh, General Hi, Rawlings Gary. was a politician turned what was basically became Grant's deputy yes. through almost the entire way. Uh, in my re research of Rawlings, uh, as a prosecuting attorney, he had a sharp tongue. And as we saw with Grant later on, especially as a president, he was too nice quite often. And I think part of Grant's success that he had as a military leader uh, in both theaters that he didn't have in, 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 the, in the White House was he didn't have a Rawlings that was his hatchet man that would shake people up and dress them down. Uh, what's your perspective on that, Over? I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it's a very interesting thesis. Um, and it was perpetuated by two people who knew Rollins really well. And that was James Wilson, one of his closest friends who was a grant aide, and uh, Charles Dana, the Assistant Secretary of Defense, who came down to Vicksburg to investigate Grant for drinking and for military incompetency. They became lifelong friends with Grant and were very upset that Grant had had a falling out with Rollins and didn't get to his deathbed in time. He tried to get there, but didn't get there in time. And they wrote a biography of Rollins uh, in which they lay out this thing. And um, Rollins actually had very little to do. Rollins was very upset at the end of the war because he had very little to do with military, with field operations. He never really had a lot to do with them earlier, but with a smaller staff, there were lots of discussions in Tennessee and Mississippi among the staff. It was a very tight-knit staff. Rollins had no military experience, as you said. Um, he was a lawyer from Galena, and, who Grant had met once at a, uh, a meeting to raise support for the war. And Grant was struck by his declamatory style, his amazing presence on his feet, you know, fiery black eyes and all that. But at least, he had conversations with generals. He was really shunted aside um, in the huge army of the Potomac, and um, which Grant, of course, commanded, but in a very clumsy fashion because Meade was actually in charge of that army. It was a very clumsy operation. And, and, and I think Rollins got caught in the shuffle there and wasn't as influential. And also was very sick with consumption. Um, he had gotten married at Vicksburg, met a lady there during the, right after the battle. Uh, and he was going home fairly regularly from Petersburg and she was taking care of him. It's, it's a complex story, but it would make a great novel. And, and I think Rollins deserves another look. Um, the, um, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I, that's the way I see it. Yeah, I think he deserves another look. Because it really isn't a good biography of Rollins. It really isn't a good modern biography, and he's a really influential guy. Yeah. See, he undermined Grant one time. He went back and against orders, he was against Sherman's march, and vigorously, uh, and uh, Grant had just cleared Sherman to leave Atlanta and march to Savannah to the sea, and Rollins was in Washington on other business and went straight to Stanton, the Secretary of War, and just disclosed his vigorous opposition to the effort. And Grant found out about it, not till after the war. And that led to the strain. Well, we do have um, a question from John Cooper. Would you like to ask your question, John? I hope we're not getting an audio, so I, um, I will go ahead and okay. read your question, which was uh, whether Porter personally pushed for Grant, I guess, was supportive of him or... Oh, yes, yes, uh, very close. Well, yeah, in brief, the, uh, from the time they met, Sherman met Porter first um, and, and then introduced him. And then Porter came down to Memphis and met Grant. It's an interesting meeting. And um, they stuck together and did a number of combined operations for the rest of the war uh, at Mobile. Um, where Porter was in charge of the mortar boats, and later at Wilmington, North Carolina, where Porter led to the capture and opening of Wilmington, which was the last port that was um, 
the last of the of the blockade ports that was open to uh, to illicit commerce with England, and they shut that down in December and and in January. And Porter was part of that operation, so continued a pretty close relationship. Uh, Porter is really a smart guy. He later, com you know, commandant, you know, not commandant, but you know, he, he took over command at West Point and came from. A, uh, brilliant military family, War of 1812 and all that. He's a terrific writer, and but he's also bombastic and he's a liar. And, uh, and so you got to read his autobiographies very carefully. But the essentials are correct. It's just that he's bombastic and he inflates his own authority a lot. Um, and uh, he's the one who made that famous remark that he was in, said he was in the room. He was in the room with Lincoln when um, they put together the plans for the first Vicksburg operation. And um, he said for posterity that Lincoln said that Vicksburg is the key and we will not win this war until the key is in our pocket. No one else at the meeting remembers Lincoln saying that. And Lincoln never said it himself, but we have to believe Porter. So we just don't know. Yeah. Uh, Don, this is Dave Little. Uh, one of the discussions we had uh, in Civil War was about when we talked about turning points. Yeah. Um, one of the other turning points that came up was Chattanooga. Oh, yeah. Uh, the argument being that uh, once Rosencrantz lost at, uh, at Chickamauga and now his army is locked into Chattanooga, yeah. okay, that it takes Grant to come, out, come over and straighten things out. And of course, but we don't have to discuss the battle itself. Yes. But after it's over, that's when Grant moves east. Yes. That's when Grant gets put in command. So uh, I've always heard a discussion about about turning point, and they always throw in Gettysburg and Vicksburg, great because of the same day. But then uh, the question comes up about Chattanooga uh, and, its in, and its importance, but mostly on the basis that from that battle, Grant now comes east and kind of takes command of the whole military side. Right, right. Um, that's close to my heart. Um, my next book, which I'm writing pretty intensively right now, is on the last year of the war, uh, when Grant does take over from um, Halleck and becomes commander in chief of all American armies. And it deals with Grant and Lincoln. Um, Lincoln, of course, from the White House and Grant running the whole war from a two-room cabin in Virginia. I rode by that two-room cabin. I said, what the hell is that? And I never knew, this is many, many years ago, 20 years ago, I said, I never knew the James River was so majestic. And the cabin sits right on it on a cliff. And I went over there and said, U.S. Grant ran the entire army. Sherman, every, all American troops in every theater, while he's fighting Lee, He's running that. And later I found out he's writing at sometimes 45 dispatches a day. Well, how did he get there? Well, Chattanooga is the key. So I'm opening my book with Chattanooga, uh, the new book. And when Grant arrives, um, he's, it's a great story. He had hurt himself in, a, in, a, in an accident in New Orleans, a horseback accident. Some claim he was drunk, that is not. But anyway, he was on crutches when he went to Chattanooga. And Chattanooga was under siege by, uh, by General Bragg at the time. And it's just, I mean, you talk about majestic mountains in Chattanooga, straight up and down, uh, like the Pyrenees in Spain, uh, where I love to ski. But it's, they're trapped. And Grant goes to Chattanooga. He can't make it through um, on donkey. He can't make it through by train. And they put him over, put him up on a horse and for two days, mud and rain and sleet, he slept on the ground, he arrives there. And within three days, he turned the whole battle around because Chattanooga couldn't get supplies. Um, they couldn't feed. General Thomas, who's the commander, can't feed his own army. And Grant hatches on to a plan that one of the commanders was drafting, a guy named Baldy Smith. And within a week, they open up this, this, this this cracker line they called it and they started to feed the army and it's a short time after that that grant takes chattanooga and uh and then he snatches sheridan phil sheridan 
um, who takes McPherson's place as, you know, in Grant's heart. And Sheridan is hugely important in taking and destroying the Shenandoah Valley just the way Grant destroyed Vicksburg by fire and smoke and stealing slaves. And Sherman was the scourge of Georgia and Sheridan coming out of Chattanooga because it was the scourge of the Shenandoah Valley. And so uh, Baldy Smith came east as well. And, uh, and Grant thought about bringing Sherman with him to replace Meade, but at the last minute decided to stick with Meade and Sherman of course went down to Atlanta and into the sea. So Chattanooga, yeah, that's how I'm gonna open the whole book with uh, an account by one of Grant's aides of seeing Grant for the first time and another aide being with him when he went across the mountain. Yeah. He fell again when they went across the mountain and hurt the other leg as well. So it's a great story. And then a couple months later, he's uh, the first general, uh, lieutenant general next to Washington in American history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it's over the whole struggle in the East. And Think about it. Less than five years before he was stocking goods in his father's hardware store in Galena, Illinois. Oh with, a, with a family, a couple, three kids. He had failed at farming. He had failed at real estate. He had failed as a government worker. He had failed on, in farming and he'd been thrown out of the army for drinking. And take him forward. A year, he's a brigadier general later, and he learns about it by reading about it in the newspaper. That's how desperately they need generals. He arrives at Cairo. Two days later, he takes a place called Paducah, which opens up to Tennessee and, uh, in fact, all rivers south that ran from Cairo, um, the Cumberland, the Tennessee. Grant saw them as avenues of invasion. He said, I'll combine with the Navy and I'll pull this off. Before he got to Cairo, one of his friends, I found this in the archives, I haven't seen another Lincoln book. Well, one book, uh, Bruce Catton, great book, uh, Grant Goes South. But he's sitting on a picnic table in the yard before he's taking over command at Cairo. And he has these big maps and he's got a red crayon. He's marking it all up and, and his buddy leans over his shoulder and Grant has this intense uh, concentration so that if he was in a tent working at a desk and a paper blew across the tent, he wouldn't get up. He'd stay in the sitting position and walk across in a sitting position to pick the paper up so he wouldn't have to get up. That's how he concentrated, iron concentration. So he draws these maps and his friend said, what are you doing? He said, these are invasion routes. The South is building forts along these rivers. They think they're gonna blockade these rivers and the Mississippi, but they're avenues of invasion. And we're gonna to get together with the Navy and we're gonna fight we're going to become river warriors, river warriors. And, and, and that's exactly what he was. So he, he's a pretty amazing guy. And then he takes, that year he takes um, Port Henry and Donaldson. Donaldson is the biggest victory of the war. He gets the term unconditional Senator Grant. It's the first big union victory of the war. The next year he invades Vicksburg. That summer he takes Vicksburg. Then he takes Chattanooga. Then he goes and a year later, 14 months later, he takes Richmond and Lee. And he did all that in a three and a half year period from Galena. <laughs> There's no story like that in American history. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. And he drank a little bit along the way too. <laughs> well, let me well, ask oh. a question here that uh, I think will uh, consolidate a few here. And I wanted to thank you for a great presentation, Mr. Miller. And I'm, it's good to hear that a, uh, a fellow philosophy major uh, can do well. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, one of the things that you mentioned in your talk was about how the Confederates were fighting for their homes. And I haven't really focused on that. You know, there's always the discussion about slavery versus states' rights, even in, you mentioned that, um, the Angels book, um, Shura's book. Uh, but uh, they were fighting for their homes. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that I can understand. And that maybe uh, is a good way to introduce uh, Christine's question here. Um, and 
Christine, I don't know if uh, you want to explain it, but she, I'll, I'll say this in case she doesn't catch it. She's a Yankee. But she finds herself in a North Carolina town. And yeah. she's trying to understand this, uh, uh, the region, the South, and reading lots of Southern fiction. But the war still simmers here. And do you think that, and do you think that there's a legacy of Vicksburg today throughout the South? Um, well, in Vicksburg, they didn't celebrate the 4th of July until 1955. And uh, Eisenhower had to go down there and tell him, hey, <laughs> get over it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you walk around Vicksburg and there's still houses. And this just isn't for the tourist trade with Confederate flags flying and things like that. And um, there's racial tension in the town. There's a black mayor, but there's still some tension. Um, they blew up a car in front of a black bar uh, long before I, you know, I went down there on a book tour and nobody got a sentence. They told don't do that again. A bunch of white boys from the area. But there's still some of that. But on the other hand, it's really simmered down a lot. There's a museum down there that's still, it's, the guy who runs it, you know, is named Gordon Cotton. And Gordon's a great guy and a wonderful host and a real Southern gentleman. But he, you know, he believes in racial supremacy. And he has a very, disturbing uh, museum that a book rebels in the attic had, he has a chapter on this and on cotton's place and um, um, the, the, the exhibits about the Ku Klux Klan and he actually has a the fist of a black man who was lynched and lynching did not just mean hook stringing you up it, it usually meant barbecuing you and uh, burning you on a stake or a pit and then people would run up and cut off parts of the body as souvenirs. And he kept in a case, this souvenir. And, and, and essentially what is a museum that glorifies in the old W.D. Griffith fashion, the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan. So there are traces of that. It's, it's a mixed area. Then you go to the University of Mississippi and they have one of the greatest programs I've ever seen for, rec or for racial reconciliation. Um, one by a, a Jewish woman who, whose parents uh, were killed in the Holocaust. And, um, the, um, and they contextualize every statue they have, mentioning this guy was a slaveholder, mentioning all this other sort of stuff. And by the way, on that point about fighting for their homes, um, it's like in combat. You're fighting not for your country at the time you're under the gun. You're fighting for your comrades and yourself. But in the larger sense, the battle cools down. You, you know what you're fighting for. You're fighting for the United States of America and all it stands for. And, and these boys who fought for their homes, if, if things cooled down and you asked them what it was all about, they believed in slavery and they wrote about it in, in, their, uh, in their accounts. And when they were freed uh, and Grant, instead of sending them to prison camps, paroled them. And that meant you signed a certificate that you would go home, not fight until you were exchanged for other prisoners from, your, from the Yankee side. And I have a lot of letters of patrolled Confederate soldiers who were very upset when they went home that found that blacks in their terms, this is a 50s term, but I even saw it used in, these, in the 1860s, were uppity and were taken over the town and there were rapes of unfounded rapes of white women and things like that. There's a lot of anger. And when Sherman returned, Sherman, at the end of the war, Grant, this is kind of where my book ends, Grant sends, he's taken Vicksburg, and then he says to Sherman, go and drive Joseph Johnson's army of relief out of the state, and then destroy Jackson, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sherman did that. And on the way back, he wrote to Grant, and he said, these people are psychologically finished. And... Um, Grant believed it, and he thought the same thing was happening in Vicksburg. He saw all kinds of reconciliation, and certain Confederates were willing to run for mayor of a Union town. And three weeks later, both of them, Sherman and Grant, changed their tune. And it's interesting that a reporter who covered the campaign, a guy named Cadwallader, who covered all of Grant's campaigns, he disagreed with Sherman when Sherman was coming back from Jackson. He said, I read, Sherman read me his letters to Grant saying this place has had it psychologically and physically. He said, but all I see is burning, burning hatred and revenge. And uh, I ain't seen nobody 
was ready to get along with the Yankees. And, <laughs> and, and Sherman and Grant both came around to that point of view a month later. And they had a real guerrilla problem on their hands, trying to protect black women on these cam in these camps and things like that. So it stayed ugly for, uh, well, right through Reconstruction. Reconstruction did just blow up drink right after. You know, that's the thing when we periodize history, Christine and I used to talk a lot about that when we were doing that show, Biography of America. These things overlap and Reconstruction's part of the Civil War and, and it's beginning to be taught as part of the Civil War. And it was. But the racial violence breaks out as soon as the grant lightens the holds on some of the garrisons and brings the troops home after the war. Yeah. Christine, did you uh, have anything to expand on that question? Um, I don't know if I captured the entirety of your question. So if you have any follow-ups, uh, I think you're on mute though. Um. I don't really ha have, it, it more has to do with, well, um, what is the gestalt of the South um, uh, in, in relation to the civil, I, I'm trying to understand it down here. It's just very different. Um, and what I'm hearing Don say uh, about uh, uh, the, the idea that the South is psychologically finished, they're not. And they're not I'm even- saying after the war, after the war. Right. Right. Well, well, look, the South isn't the South anymore. I mean, when I saw those returns coming in from North Carolina, the places like Raleigh, for example, 87% Democratic, uh, Dallas, and all of Georgia go Democrat. It's a different area. Um, uh, Vicksburg, Jackson have, as I said, black mayors. Um, I, I, one of the best books I've ever read, a series of books that I've ever read on this very thing is by Eudora Welty. Right. who um, lived in Jackson. And, and now the, uh, the Library of America has a, a new volume out on, on right. her work. And uh, she tries to get into this whole thing, getting, because she stayed in Jackson her entire life. And, uh, and it's a tough town, but it's turned around a lot. I found, for example, in Mississippi, three of the best bookstores in the best, one of the best hotels I've ever stayed in anywhere. And, um, or ever or bookstores ever visit um, in, you know, uh, right in the Delta, uh, in Greenwood, uh, in, in, in Oxford and in Jackson, it's fantastic bookstores. And uh, so, you know, it's hard, hard place to figure out. Yep. Hard place to figure out. People go back. I met Morgan Freeman on my tour. I mean, he lives down there. He loves it down there. He lives in the Delta. Um, Grisham moved down, but he still goes down a lot. But yeah, okay. complex place. It definitely is. I my wife's from North Carolina, and I went to medical school there. And it's way different today. And I was went to school in the seventies. Today, my brother brother in law lives in Davidson. It's totally different. Yeah, <laughs> Charlotte is cosmopolitan as anywhere in the country. I had, I had friends, John, and they were saying to me, well, uh, we're thinking of all the fires. We're going to move out of Ojai, California and go to, and go to Charlotte. I said, you crazy. And they said, it's more cosmopolitan than in parts of New York. It's, it's incredible. Oh, and it is. I, recently, sure. I visited recently in a book, so I had a hell of a time in Charlotte. A wonderful place. Um, you know, you're talking about Rollins. The, the other thing that hampered Rollins after, you know, Grant made him Secretary of War, but he had tuberculosis. And yes. He was really, he, and he ended up dying just a few years after the war. And he, that really, he was just sick the whole time after he the was. war. <laughs> As I said, he had to constantly go back home in 64, 65, <clears throat> treatments, and um, he didn't take care of himself. And they're living pretty rough in, in, uh, in Virginia when Grant's down there. It's almost like living, you know, in a slave quarters, you know, a little, you know a two bedroom, unheated, the fireplace, dirt floor <laughs> um, cabin. Well, you've, you've seen his, his, his cabin in City Point. <laughs> That's the thing that got me started on the City Point book. I, I thought to myself, here's the biggest war in American history. And it's run by a guy who's living in a two room cabin. It had a front room, it was a sitting room with a desk. And a back room was a bedroom. 
and he had his wife with him a lot of the time. And, and they're right and in the middle of secession country. And he didn't have to leave. There's a big house there he could have lived in, but he chose big not house. to. <laughs> yeah, big house. They, rebel spies broke in there and they tried to blow the port up. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that safe. Was one of the, what, I'm interested in it was one of the largest hospitals that the Union had was at City Point. It's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, I, I'm doing uh, two of my characters in the books are nurses who served down there. As you know, from reading my book, I deal a lot with nurses. And um, the, um, we mentioned the disease at Vicksburg and the nurses. I mean, Mary Livermore, who um, was an aid worker from Chicago, one of the great women of the 19th century, kind of the Jane Addams of the mid 19th century. And she raised money and for vegetables and fruits and bandages and everything else, worked for the sanitary fairs and everything. But on her first trip down river to Vicksburg, um, the first thing she saw were coffins floating in the river and, and, and bodies as well, because the Yankee soldiers, their camps had been flooded by the overflow of the river. It was high, the high river. And they had to live on top of the levees, these are huge earthen mounds. And when a crevasse would occur, a break in the levee, the levee would split open. And because the levee was the only dry spot, they would bury their dead there. So their dead would pour out into the river. And um, that was a sight to see. And, and that's when she learned, as you point out, that there were tens of thousands of guys dying at Vicksburg. It's, it's the Valley Forge of the Civil War. Uh, the camps at Vicksburg are unbelievable. Yeah, I, I, have, I have her book, Mary. You know, Mary it's, 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 it's something. It's, 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 <laughs> It really is something. I mean, and, and, and there's a great scene where her friend, Mary Hodge from Chicago, who came down a couple of times and then was even on the battlefront at Vicksburg because her son was wounded down there. And she's an aid worker. And she was in the camps when Mary was there and she heard some commotion outside uh, her supply tent. And there's a bunch of Yankee soldiers hooping and hollering. And she went down to the riverbank and asked them what was going on. And they said, well, there's a load of coffins coming in. And they said, we're going to get buried decently. We're not going to get thrown on the no. in an army blanket. They were happy if the coffins were there because they said they knew they were going to die. Everybody was dying. And uh, that's where Sherman did some of his greatest work of the war. They say he was unbelievable caring for his men. Um, and Grant, lobbying strenuously with the big hospitals up at Memphis. Because the big hospitals were getting all the money and there weren't enough field hospitals and, and surgeons to go down there. Um, but that's your field, John, Civil War Medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, it's fascinating. I, I've studied the East more, but uh, yeah, and you know, Mary, she didn't end up at Vicksburg, but uh, of course, Mary Ann Bricker Dyke was the other important, yeah. you know, the big important nursing figures are in the West, in the Western theater. 130 hospitals she formed. Yeah. <laughs> she yeah. was at Cairo. <laughs> and they employed, much to the disgruntlement of the army, they employed black women who weren't usually allowed in the wards, but she opened the wards up. And they were the one, I think Sherman said she outranks me. <laughs> yeah, <they did. laughs> now, along the lines of the the disease, I see Peggy Higgins has uh, asked a question about a lot of the hunger that also yeah. was Inside there. Inside Vicksburg, it got rough. I mean, they weren't defeated militarily. They were just ground down. And they had enough ammo um, inside the city. But um, the, the troops were really beat up. They were in really bad shape. Um, and uh, most of them from malaria and dysentery. And, um, but before that, of course, they aren't well fed and neither was the civilian population. There were rumors that they ate rats. I don't think so, but they did eat muskrats and they ate a lot of mule meat. Um, they slaughtered all their mules and um, uh, they were down to the bone. They were eating a thing called pea bread, um, which is an ugly concoction. You throw some grits and some peas and you fry it. And, um, so the nutrition counts are really low. By the way, John, I found an incredible archive at Tulane. Tulane has, you know, as you know, has a pretty good medical school. Oh, I went to school at Tulane. No, oh, all right. 
That wasn't a plant. <laughs> <laughs> to but, where I met my wife. <laughs> anyway, great place. And they have, a, they have the best, you know, most of the Civil Archives were destroyed in the fire at Richmond, just like in World War II at St. Louis. But the best records from the Vicksburg campaign, medical records, are, are at the, um, in the medical hospital, uh, in the library of the medical hospital down at Tulane. There's a separate section in the library. And they have casualty counts, and, uh, really beautifully organized um, accounts breaking down uh, the amount of disease. And then a number of their doctors have written um, books and articles about Vicksburg uh, and the medical situation at Vicksburg in both campaigns. Yeah, I have them in my bibliography. Yeah, that was it an did sound like a plant. Uh, the, the, the question, uh, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. But I also want to say thank you for talking about the effect of war on civilian populations. Uh, uh, it's an un, un, uh, appreciated aspect. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, actually, that, that was one of the reasons why I said about the hunger, because for years after the war, the civilian population, which also could impact continuing resentment after all these decades, um, of how hungry and starved they were. They were, yeah, they were in a really rough condition. I mean, and it got sometimes got a little ugly in the city because the troops, the poor kids are, are roaming around looking for a meal and they're robbing gardens and things like that. And a couple of Confederate soldiers were shot by Confederate civilians robbing gardens and stuff. That all melted down. That happened mostly during the Farragut uh, siege, the naval siege. By the time Grant goes down there, there's a gr really strong reconciliation between the town and, um, uh, and, and the troops. And women are taking in um, battle shattered mentally and physically uh, Confederate veterans. There weren't enough hospitals. Literally Vicksburg has turned into two things, a hospital and a graveyard. And uh, all of it under steady um, fire from mortar scout, siege mortars. The shells weighed 450 pounds and uh, they could blow half a block out, you know, if they hit anything correctly. They were, they were radically inaccurate, but they were a great terror weapon. Um, well, my, my father's people were um, <clears throat> from Atlanta and were there when it was called Marthasville. And so we're certainly there from the, for the Civil War. My great grandmother was very young uh, at that time, and the bitterness um, from my grandmother and that generation continued, um, and they didn't die until the 1970s, 1980s. So um, the hunger part, as well as Sherman's March to the Sea, um, was burned in their soul. Oh, of course, Margaret Mitchell plays heavily on that and going with that. <laughs> well, actually, my great aunt went to school with Margaret Mitchell, although they wouldn't <laughs> Talk to her because she was divorced. <laughs> you know, absolutely and absolute and, and, and Gone with the Wind were written in the same year. Yeah. What was her? I'm sorry? Two books to use in a course. I don't know if anybody's ever done it. <laughs> what two books? Absolute and Absalom, Faulkner's book. Oh, oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, Gone with the Wind, 1936. You know, what, what Peggy said was consistent with what I've heard when you think about it. If some of these people have lived uh, um, quite a while, they've, they've carried on this, this resentment and this hatred. Um, a colleague of mine once said, and he was from Alabama, he said uh, he, his father took him to every battlefield in Alabama, except for where the Union won. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, they wouldn't bury, uh, Kurt, they wouldn't bury a lot of Yankee deceased, um, uh, even in their backyards. And uh, Drew Bil Gilpin Faust in her book on recovering the dead has some really powerful chapters on that. Well, there, there's a question in, in the chat from John Anderson that says, uh, uh, he's talking about this Republic of Suffering, uh, the, That's the uh, book. Drew Faust book, yeah. uh, where she, he, he says she points out the South was not able to properly bury their dead. Uh, she points this out that this has been a linger, caused lingering frustration and keeps the war alive today in many ways. I mean, I hadn't actually thought about that. Is that true that- Yeah, that's true, but so on both sides, <laughs> on both sides, in, in areas that were riven, like Kentucky, for example, um, where 
this thing started as family feuds and turned into war feuds and then resentment feuds after the war, um, there's a disinclination to, to bury the dead on the other side. Well, uh, for yeah. example, the, the Confederate dead at Gettysburg that were buried there, they remained there till the, like 1874 when they finally raised enough money for the yep. Southern women to come up and bring them back to, to the South. Yep. Yeah. Plus, co Congress passed, uh, passed uh, funds to bury the Union dead, not the Confederates. Hell was, yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> the Confederacy to do it. Yeah, and, she deals uh, with a guy who, 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 uh, who directed that effort, went all over the South, you know, burying bodies after the war. Walter has a question about the uh, railroad. You mentioned, and we got in off topic, and when we were talking about City Point, but that was the uh, that was the proof that the Civil War was a railroad war because they delivered munitions and supplies to the forts directly by rail. And when I was there in 2002, there was still a small stretch of the original track that was still in place that served a industry. So you could get an idea of how vast that area was just by looking at that. It's the thing yeah, that Ed, Ed Bars was working on to try to restore a lot of that stuff when he was down there. And of course, he has a two volume study on Petersburg. But um, Petersburg became the Cairo of the Eastern Theater. It was Cairo the epicenter. I mean, from a mud hole. I opened the, the, the heart of the book after the Faulkner thing. I got from Faulkner to, <laughs> to Charles Dickens visiting Cairo and, um, and describing it as a godforsaken, disease ridden, mosquito ridden mud hole. It's nothing. And I have a picture of it in the book. You see the desolation. And a year later, when Trollope visits there, the English writer, it's the center of the war. And it's a, a, the biggest military city in the world. And, uh, and the same thing happened to City Point. It became the largest port in the world. Um, more ships, more shipping in and out of there every day. And, and that's how Grant takes Vicksburg by building a port on the Yazoo River when he takes Vicksburg the first thing he did before trying to take the city. And then he has to go up the Yazoo, up the Mississippi to Cairo to Chicago. Cairo is connected to Chicago by rail, the only central railroad. And at Petersburg, they can come in, land there. And there's a, they rebuilt by Ingalls was the, um, um, in charge of the engineering operations there. And he's the guy who lived in the big house. And uh, That's right. <laughs> he, he built he built the railroad right out to the front. So without moving, they could have hot meals delivered to them uh, in their forts out along the along the Union line, straight and fresh bread, fifty thousand loaves a day. So um, it was a supply war, just like Vicksburg. I saw you know that's that's how Grant wins both places: long sieges and out supplies them, and. and Casualties at Vicksburg are pretty low, uh, and uh, um, they aren't. Once Cold Harbor's over, they aren't as dramatic again. At, 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 in fact, at Petersburg um, for eleven months, and, and Grant is telling his men to not attack. They didn't attack, except for one occasion, and then at the very end. Uh, they didn't attack Confederate forts at Petersburg. And if you go there, as a lot of you people have, you see why, how elaborate the forts were, you know, with underground tunnels and telegraph stations and communication systems and gigantic guns. So um, Grant raided railroad lines around there to cut off the rails, snip the rails that, that, that ran in from Petersburg to Richmond, because if you took Petersburg, Richmond's gone, because all the rails from the south went through Petersburg to Richmond. But Grant besieges both places and holds on. And um, there's no more of those um, agonizingly um, short but annihilating battles like Cold Harbor and Spotsylvania in the wilderness. Yeah. I, th I think Doug had a uh, question about um, Grant to the casualties and is there is adversity to casualties? Doug, do you want to uh, expand on that? 
Oh, thank you very much. Professor, I love your presentation. Um, I was just uh, taken, you um, said during the siege at Vicksburg, Grant was casually averse. And then you said later on at, at Petersburg, he was casually averse. But uh, a lot of people would say he wasn't pretty, wasn't particularly casually adverse at Spotsylvania or Cold Harbor. No, no, he, that's what happened. He did what he had to do. I mean, he actually, this doesn't excuse Grant's conduct, but when he put together, it's a great question, by the way. What I'm finding is that when he planned the operations in, in Virginia, um, when um, he's just head of the Western armies, maybe anticipating that he's going to be named commander, you know, all you, you know, but, you know, but he's anticipating. And he puts together a campaign that wants to get below Richmond, come in through Norfolk, come in through North Carolina, capture Petersburg, and then besiege them and starve them out. And then have Sherman go to the sea and come up and meet him and join the siege. And without taking a lot of casualties, they would take the place. And he positioned just enough of an army because the objection was, Lincoln said, we ain't doing that because there's no army between Lee, who's in Richmond and north of it, and you, who's south of Richmond, and that army will march into Washington. Well, Grant, you know, said we're going to build up the forts, we're going to position troops in the valley, and, and we're going to take it like this. But the plan was rejected. Grant didn't want to fight in the wilderness, he didn't want to fight in Spotsylvania, and he certainly didn't want to fight at Cold Harbor. I mean, that was Lincoln's campaign. And when he finally gets down there and then crosses the James, he says, um, and he says this earlier, he says, this is what I had originally planned and uh, to get below Richmond and take it like this if I can't beat him north of Richmond. Uh, at Vicksburg, he did, you're absolutely right. When they ran the Confederate army, they finally got through Louisiana, which was flooded. They went in when the water was at the, almost at the top of the levees and they built roads as they went. Um, they built 60 miles of roads and over, over 400 bridges to Louisiana. The army, as they marched, it took a whole month. And then as they were marching, um, like Noah, they're watching the floodwaters go down. <laughs> and um, the, um, they finally get to some decent flat ground where they can cross. And on April 1st, they cross in the Mississippi and bang, bang, bang in five consecutive battles including Champion Hill, which Churchill called the most important battle of the Civil War. Churchill, by the way, wrote an interesting history of the Civil War. Um, then they locked them into Vicksburg. He chased them back in there the day after Champion Hill when they hammered them. And Grant thinks, this is an exhausted, defeated army. My guys want to go in there and finish them off. Well, wait a minute. I read the letters. None of those guys wanted to go in there and finish them off. <laughs> they were tired. They were hungry. They were pissed. And they, they didn't want to be there. And, and also they saw how strong the fortifications were in the back of Vicksburg. Vicksburg had 17 guns in the front, um, 17 miles of guns, I should say, in the front and very developed fortifications on the back. And I have this one soldier named Kellogg and it's a night before the day they got there, they surveyed the forts and Grant said, we can take them. And Kellogg was an engineering officer. He walked up there, took a look and came back to the guys and he said, this is our last day on earth. <laughs> and it, it was for a lot of guys and he did it again two days later he did it again and thinking he could take the place what he forgot about it was bad logistics that the confederates had left an entire army good part of an army um a corps inside the city so they were fresh and the other troops just had to jump behind fortifications and guys behind fortifications fight a lot better than guys in the field and uh, so they held them off and Grant said, we're going to outdig them. No more casualties. So he goes, it's a yin yang. And you can't say he's casualty averse when he fights battles like that. And even apologizes as he did for um, Cold Harbor. Harbor. Yeah. Well, we uh, uh, have just a few more minutes left. It looks like we have a 825 drop dead date as it turns out. Uh, that when I dropped drop it, it, or when this thing dropped uh, it. <laughs> but, um, let's, let's give John uh, Cooper a chance. John uh, had a follow-up question. His first question was about whether actually Porter had pushed for 
Grant's removal. Um, and then his follow-up question was, uh, uh, did Porter's account of the events of City Port in April 1865, were those, was that lying and bombasticism there, I guess? <laughs> well, I don't know if Porter pushed that hard for Grant's removal. Uh, they had a falling out too near the end of the war. Um, the battle at Wilmington was blown. Um, uh, the Navy did a pretty good job, but the Army, under a general named Ben Butler, Butler. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't doesn't quite. He's supposed to land. He doesn't land, and then he's supposed to land and stay, even if the Navy got beat. Well, that was the end of Butler. Uh, the election was over. Butler was a very influential Democrat, and Lincoln could fire him now. And um, Lincoln told Porter, "Look," and the message read almost exactly like this: "You stay here. I'll be back, and I'll have a different commander with me." So, and, you know, and there was a question about his uh, account of City Point too. City Point's really an interesting place. I mean, it really is. It, it was it was not just enormous, but um, a forgotten part of this war. I think I'm trying to really bring forward, in addition to the medicine, is the, is the telegraph. You can't become general in chief and run an army without the telegraph. And it's ingenious how they set those telegraph systems up. Um, Grant has a un, largely unread or, you know, people don't pay enough attention to the brilliant chapter he has on setting up military telegraphs when they go into camp in the field in Virginia. How they come in there in wagons, lots of wagons, filled with all the paraphernalia for a telegraph system. And then they unreal, they get these donkeys and they put this cable in, on wheels behind the, on the saddles of the donkeys, and the men walk the lines out from headquarters, and they take their line. They, the camp, the camp is in a huge circle, like this, and the lines start at the middle and they lead out to the ends of the circles. Each corps, each regiment actually had its own telegraph line, and then when all the lines reach the end of the circle, they connect them, and within two hours after they landed anywhere, they were hooked up all over the battlefield. 40, 30, 40 miles, and they could communicate with one another. And you couldn't have battles like they had. Was, was that voice communications or uh, Morse code? Telegraph, Morse code. Okay. Morse code. And the telegraph connects the White House with Lincoln's two room cabin. Right next to the cabin was the telegraph office. And Lincoln carried a cipher officer because he had a special code. And he carried it with him everywhere, everywhere. And Grant had it with him the night Lincoln was killed when he, Lincoln goes to the theater and Grant goes home to New Jersey and learns about it. And then he and the telegraph officer go back to Washington. He never let that telegraph officer out of his sight. That's how people communicated. And all the dispatches and stuff you read, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, where's this shit coming from? You know, where's it all coming from? It's that telegraph. And we had a much better telegraph system. Lincoln spent hours hours every day and sometimes all night in the telegraph office. They warned him not to go over there at midnight because there's a little bit of a copse of, of trees that is obscured from the road. And, you know, a burglar could be in there, an assassin could be in there. Of course, Lincoln always said no one would ever kill a president. And um, he was the first one to, to get me killed. And it's, he's there all the time. Listen to the election returns coming in communicating with Grant after every battle. And then he goes down to, uh, spends two weeks of the last three weeks of his life with Grant at City Point. He lives with him and he literally lives all day in the telegraph office. And while Grant is winning the last battle of the Civil War, he's communicating with Grant, Lincoln is. And Lincoln writes to him and says, Sheridan tells me, that if we press the point, we have them. And Lincoln writes back, press the point. By okay, the way, so they, never, they never broke, I see the question, they never oh, broke yeah. the cipher. Yeah. They do. Well, they that do. might be a good segue uh, to yeah. the end here because I know you're working on, and I got cut off earlier, but I know you're working on a, a new book with about Lincoln and Grant, and maybe we can have you back um, again because it looks like we have more questions than we have time for. Yeah. 
before before we sign off here, Kurt, I would wanted to just let people know what our upcoming uh, who our upcoming uh, speakers are too. Okay. Well, I do want to thank uh, Don for an excellent oh, for presentation sure. and John absolutely questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Don. Thank you, guys. You great questions. Yeah, yeah. we we enjoyed Back having forth. you. Yeah. Learned a lot. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, Confed the Confederates, yeah. Never broke the code. Yeah, I think we have all the questions. Does anyone else have questions? And okay. John, 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 thank, John thank you. And God, what a job you have. You and <laughs> you and Biden's team uh, fighting COVID. Get back well, to the battlefront. <laughs> uh, you know, my, I wanted to unretire, but my wife wouldn't let me. She said one pandemic was enough, HIV. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, go get them, man. Um, thank you. Any, anyhow, so our, ne our next speaker is going to be one of our own, uh, Bob Plum, uh, on November 24th, speaking about his bo new book, Better Angels About Civil War Women. Uh, December is going to be another one of our members who's actually here tonight, uh, Gary Carlberg as General Meade. Uh, in January, January 12th, we're going to have Jan Kroon, whose book I'm reading now called War Outside My Window, which is a pretty fascinating account of a young boy's who, uh, experiences in Macon, Georgia during the war. January 26th, uh, Dwight Hughes is going to be uh, talking about uh, Monitor at Hampton Roads. And then our joint meeting in February with uh, the uh, Lincoln Group is going to be uh, Michael Burlingame, uh, noted Lincoln scholar, uh, talking about Lincoln and his meeting with uh, Black leaders about colonization. I would also mention, for those of you who are interested, uh, we're talking about the relationship between General Grant and President Lincoln. The January speaker for the Lincoln Group, who is going to be a friend of mine, Kurt Fields, uh, who portrays uh, General Grant. And Kurt's going to be talking about that relationship between, he's going to be a peer as General Grant talking about the relationship between Lincoln and Grant that, that uh, Don was talking about. Uh, Dwight Hughes is our January 20, uh, I spoke, I sorry, I said that. Uh, March 8th, I'm sorry, March 9th will be Steve Fan, who is the ranger in charge of the defenses of, the, of DC, talking about DC Civil War forts. April 13th is Gail Stevens talking about the Lincoln conspirators. May 11th is Jean Schmiel about Civil War rapscallions and rascals, would be interesting. And June 8th, we're gonna have uh, Ed Barr's former uh, partner for Smithsonian Tours, Greg Clemmer, who has a wonderful talk in Civil War memory. Uh, the only caveat is going to be is if we're live, because Greg will only do uh, live presentations. So that's, that's our wrap up uh, so far, because we have gone to our format of having a second uh, meeting uh, at the end of the month since we're on Zoom. Okay, do you have anything further to add, Kurt? Nope, nothing to add, and thank you very much uh, okay. uh, for, for everything, too. Thank you, Kurt, thank you, thank everybody. Yeah, once again, I wanna thank Don uh, for a great presentation, and I wanna thank everyone else uh, for coming. Books and just out in paperback. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Don. Yeah, I highly recommend the book, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Take care. Good night, everybody. Okay. Yes. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night Be careful. Everybody.